So uh, Jan LeCun is a professor of computer science at NYU, uh, chief of AI at Facebook, um, one of the pioneers along with Yoshio Bengio and Jeff Hinton in the development of deep learning and convolutional networks. And his title is, What are the Principles of Learning in Newborns? Thank you, Tony. Uh, thanks for you know, coming so early on a, on a Sunday. Um, this is really a question to you. I'm not going to give the answer. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's a, a question I'm, I'm puzzled by, and, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. I have two slides about vision, though. That's enough. It's enough. Um, so, um, you know, deep learning has, uh, uh, has been incredibly successful over the last few years, and it works really well, but it's all about supervised learning. So, you know, we can do things like build uh, vision systems that simultaneously do uh, recognition, localization, detection, uh, draw the outline of every object. You know, you can get uh, vision systems now that basically in real time give you this kind of results. Not only does it identify every object in a scene, it actually gives you an outline of every object, a bounding box, of course, that's easy, a category. And if you have enough data, you, you can train those things. And, and you know, they're a little bit like, like baby visual systems that kind of merge both the ventral and dorsal pathways. They, they do simultaneous uh, localization and recognition. So, you know, that works really well. Um, it, it gives amazing results that, you know, even people in computer vision uh, would not have thought just five years ago we would, we would be able to do this, particularly, you know, this in real time. There's a system of this type uh, built at Facebook that uh, actually runs at a few frames per second on a smartphone. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing how much progress has been made there. Um, and by the way, this is all open source. If for those of you who want to play with those things, you can just download it and you can retrain it and whatever. So um, it's called Detectron, um, the, the whole system. Uh, so that works really well. And it's, you know, it's because of this kind of technology that, uh, you know, in AI, we can, we can have things like uh, self-driving cars, you know, better medical image analysis systems, um, decent language translation that uses basically the same architecture. It's also convolutional nets, at least the ones that are used at Facebook. Um, you know, we can build chatbots, but they're very stupid. Uh, and we can do all kinds of stuff. But th there's a number of things we cannot do. And th there are things that, you know, every animal seems to be able to do. Like, uh, you know, a house cat has more common sense than, than any of the AI systems we can build. Uh, based on whatever set of techniques you, you can imagine. Uh, we can actually build uh, intelligent personal assistance, you know, the things that will actually understand what you're saying uh, with sort of general enough uh, topics. Um, you know, we can have household robots. You know, it's still a big, a big challenge for a robot to, you know, fill up a dishwasher or something. Um, the, the, the sort of perception and control loop is, is really not, not great. Nothing like even simple animals, what simple animals can do. Um, and we're, we're nowhere near having the basic science for uh, artificial general intelligence, if, if that's a concept that uh, you're interested in. So, uh, um, you know, you contrast this with uh, newborn, you know, baby humans or, or, or mammals, and they learn an incredible amount of stuff in a very short time, basically just by observation, particularly baby humans. They don't, you know, baby humans don't, uh, are not, very well developed in terms of motor control. And so um, I, I stole those things from Emmanuel Dupoux uh, that many of you maybe know. So, y you know, if, uh, if you show uh, a scene like this to a baby, maybe three months old, uh, it looks like this thing is kind of floating in the air. Of course, it's a trick. And babies say, well, you know, that's the way the world works. No problem. Sure, why not? After eight months or so, they go like this because they say, what's going on? You know, this should fall. You know, they figured out the notion of gravity and things like this, right? Um, and, and again, in the first few months of life, certainly in the first few minutes of life, there is very little interaction. Um, so Emmanuel put together this, uh, this chart that uh, attempts, you know, by measuring how surprised babies are uh, with a particular situation, uh, figuring out at what stage uh, very basic concepts about the physical world uh, are, are captured by the internal model of the world that babies built, basically just by observation with very little interaction with the world. So things, of course, like face tracking, you know, things like edge detectors basically pop up in a few minutes or perhaps even in the womb. Um, uh, kind of motion detection, uh, which, you know, immediately kind of 
leads to face tracking pops up extremely early. In fact, it's kind of immeasurably short. Uh, uh, very simple concepts, you know, Piaget type concept like object permanence pop up in the first couple of months. Uh, the difference between uh, animate and inanimate, inanimate objects um, it becomes pretty obvious uh, within three months. And, you know, rigidity, solidity, um, kind of natural categories of objects, stability and support is, is about five months. And then, you know, basic intuitive physics, uh, inertia, um, gravity, things like this is sort of between six and eight months, roughly. <coughs> and then, you know, it goes from there. So those, those are concepts that sort of build on top of each other. You know, somewhere here, it's kind of hard to measure, but babies figure out that the world is three-dimensional. You know, the, the notion that um, there are objects in the world that are in front of others um, is kind of natural. You know, if uh, any motion of the head uh, will, will make parallax kind of obvious. And the best explanation for how the world changes when you move your head is the fact that the world is three-dimensional. So perhaps there is some sort of, you know, mechanism that gets uh, babies to learn this very quickly. Um, this is the kind of learning that we don't know how to do with machines. And, um, and I think it's one of the big obstacles to making real progress in AI and also a big obstacle to understanding really what, uh, you know, how the brain learns essentially. So there's, there's two big questions on the way to real AI, but also on the way to understanding intelligence more generally, whether it's, you know, artificial or natural. Um, and so th the second one, I'm not going to talk about too much today, not at all, actually, um, uh, because this is sort of something that we don't observe in a lot of animals. But, um, but here, uh, you know, the question is, how can machines learn as efficiently as humans and animals? You know, what are the underlying principles for this kind of learning that, uh, you know, where babies seem to be able to accumulate a huge amount of background knowledge about the world in just a few months uh, of, of life, mostly by observation, without any supervision, essentially, certainly not for animals for many animals, and with very, very little interaction with the world. Uh, this is very much unlike, uh, you know, reinforcement learning as it is practiced today in machine learning and, uh, and supervised learning, certainly. So my guess is that the next uh, revolution in, in AI and perhaps uh, in computational neuroscience uh, will not be supervised. I have to thank Alyosha Eiffels for the concept of this slide. Um, um, but, you know, he used a, a different uh, fresco here, I have, have a French theme here. Um, okay, so <coughs> big obstacle to AI is learning models of the world. Uh, I, I think uh, the essence of intelligence to some extent is the ability to predict. Uh, and so again, I'm not gonna talk about the second one, more, more well, a little bit about the second one because I think the ability to learn models of the world is what allows uh, us and, and animals to, uh, to plan, really. Um, and really, the, there is a, a kind of a, a theme behind this, uh, which is sort of a, a red herring in, in AI called uh, common sense. So machines don't have common sense. It's very frustrating right now to talk to uh, a, a virtual assistant, because if you go outside of this kind of scripted domain, they basically don't understand what you're talking about. And their understanding of what you say is very shallow, you know, it's very scripted. So the question is, how do we get machines to acquire common sense? And there is some sense that <coughs> common sense is, uh, comes from the accumulation of lots and lots of background knowledge about how the world works. And there are people, you know, for 30 years or so who have attempted to get machines to acquire common sense by basically typing facts and rules about the world. Uh, this project called Psych has been going on for over 30 years now, not going very far. Um, so there's little question that, uh, in my mind, that, you know, this should be done by, by learning and perhaps the kind of learning that we observe in, uh, in babies and animals. So what is common sense, really? And, you know, if we, if we want to try to find sort of an operational or technical definition of common sense, I'd say it's the ability to fill in the blanks. And this is a hypothesis, right? It's not a fact or a claim I'm making. It's a, it's a working hypothesis. <coughs> so basically, in the ability to infer the state of the world from partial information, to predict the future from the past and present, to infer the past, past events from present state. That's useful if you are a police inspector. Um, but also if you kind of, you know, want to learn about, about how the world works. And then, you know, it goes all the way down to very low level things like, uh, you know, filling up illusory contours, like uh, filling up the blind spot in your retina. You know, we're not even conscious of the fact that we have a blind spot. 
Um, so these are all prediction, predictions of, you know, kind of filling in the missing information from incomplete perception. So think about, uh, uh, you know, perception at a particular time as kind of a slice of a volume where, you know, the past is on one side, the future is on the other side, and you're observing a partial information of the, your perceptual world at, at this particular time. And, you know, perhaps what our brains are trying to do is sort of filling in everything that we haven't yet observed. So the future, of course, perhaps the stuff that in the present that we haven't uh, observed. So, for example, I can infer pretty well what the texture of the, of the ground looks like behind the lectern and, uh, and the stage. Um, you know, I may not never have seen it, but, you know, by, by sort of continuation. And, uh, of course, I can just, you know, look around and, 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 and get what it is and kind of adjust my internal model uh, of the world. Um, <coughs> so, you know, having the ability to, to, to uh, have predictive models uh, is, is essential for, for, for intelligent behavior and for planning. So I'm going to come to this in a, in a minute. So I'm not sure what to call this type of learning of kind of, I've, I've, I've sort of come up with something called imputative learning, which is sort of very difficult to pronounce and probably not very understandable. You know, it's from the idea of statistical imputation, you're kind of filling values for missing variables. Um, some people call this self-supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is not really great because uh, it, it, it's kind of a loaded uh, term in, in machine learning. Predictive learning is a little too generic, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what to call this. Um, but, but I think it's, it's really key to, to, to common sense. So, um, you, know, it's this, you know, this joke about object permanence, of course. Uh, these are basic concepts that we, that we learn by observation, and it's not, it's not just humans. Um, so here is a, a baby orangutan here. It's being shown a magic trick, right? You put a, an object in a cup, and then you know, get rid of the object without him seeing, and then show the empty cup, and you know, he's you know, rolling on the floor laughing. Um, <laughs> And, you know, those, those guys are almost as smart as we are. Uh, this is a baby orangutan, not, not an adult. And, you know, when our model of the world is being broken, we, we have three possible reactions. <laughs> and perhaps all three at the same time. We, you know, one of them, we laugh, because, you know, that's, that's the basic of humor, right? You have impossible things happening. Um, another one is uh, we're scared because all of a sudden what we thought was going to happen is, is not happening the way we predicted and maybe something dangerous will happen. And the third thing is we pay attention. And this is exactly what happens, you know, this is how you measure whether the, you know, a baby's model of the world is being broken by looking, you know, s looking at how, how attentive they are. Um, why do we pay attention? It's because, you know, we need to adjust our internal model with whatever prediction error. So, you know, we make a prediction, the prediction is wrong, we need to pay attention to, um, to what's going on. So um, th there is, um, so this, this type of uh, learning by observation without, without supervision, without trials and rewards, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, Jeff Hinton and many others have been claiming is really uh, very important for a long time. Um, so this is a, a quote from, uh, from Jeff. So this is an argument about basically based on learning theory. He says, the brain has about 10 to the 14 synapses, and we only live for about 10 to the 9 seconds. So we have a lot more parameters than data. This motivates the idea that we must do a lot of unsupervised learning, uh, which means predicting basically every perceptual afference from every other, uh, since the perceptual input, including proprioception, is the only place where we can get 10 to the 50 dimension of constraints per second. Um, and he's been saying this for a long time, and the first 20 years he's been saying this, I didn't believe him, um, but change, I changed my mind. Um, so there's really three types of learning that, that you know, people in, in machine learning kind of uh, uh, know about or, or categorize, although there is, you know, kind of porous borders between them. So reinforcement learning is the idea that uh, you wait for the machine to produce an action, and then uh, the environment or, or, or someone gives it a penalty or reward. Um, and so it's a very weak feedback. You just, you just give the machine one scalar, and the only thing you ask the machine to predict is this one scalar, essentially. In the process of predicting that scalar, that machine has to produce an output, but you never give it, you never tell it what the correct output is. And so um, the amount of feedback information from the environment is very weak. And the result is that the number of samples that a, a pure reinforcement learning system needs to be able to learn anything 
is extremely large. The, the sample complexity, as uh, learning theory say, is, is horrible. Um, supervised learning has weak feedback. You tell the machine what the correct answer is, but it's only a few bits of information, right? If it's one category among a thousand, it's just 10 bits of information per sample. And it's just not that large either. Whereas with uh, you know, predictive, unsupervised, or imputative learning, you basically ask the machine to predict every single variable that it ever observes at any one time. And so there's a huge amount of feedback there from the environment. Um, and that's the only way you can constrain you know, large brains or large learning machines to kind of learn anything. Um, or at least learn anything without kidding itself. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, um, it's possible to use reinforcement learning, but it just requires too many trials in the real world. So it works for games, but not for much else. So that led me to this uh, uh, obnoxious analogy here, um, where you know, in terms of amount of information that the machine is being given from the environment, reinforcement learning is just a few bits of information once in a while. Supervised learning is kind of you know, like the icing on the cake. It's uh, just kind of a, a thin layer of information. Most of the information from the world comes from perceptual afferents, and that's what the machine should be able, you know, should use to uh, learn models of, uh, of the world. Problem is, in machine learning, we, we know how to make the cherry, we know how to make the icing, we have no idea how to make the cake. That's kind of the, the dark matter of AI, if you want. Um, and so pure IRL really doesn't work in the real world. Uh, if you wanted to use reinforcement learning to uh, learn a machine to drive, it would probably have to drive off a cliff a few thousand times before it figures out not to do that. Um, and you know, anything you do in the world can kill you, and, and the problem with the real world is that you can't run it faster than real time, so you know, it, takes, it takes a long time uh, if, you, if you need to have you know, four million trials. So you know, it works really great for games, for Go or stuff like that, where you, know, you can run the Go environment at very, very high frame rate, if you want, uh, on hundreds of machines uh, simultaneously, and you can train a machine to basically kind of completely nail it in, uh, in a few hours. Um, it works for uh, other types of games like, uh, like Doom. So this is um, people from, from Facebook have actually won the Doom competition two years in a row. <laughs> um, uh, this is you know, a slightly violent game. But, um, but there again, you know, the number of trials is kind of unlimited in a way. So y you know, how do we get out of this? Uh, the, the, sort of, um, the, the way um, a model of the world is used uh, in an intelligent system is that you have some sort of simulator, and this is sort of from classical optimal control. If you want to figure out a sequence of, of commands that will achieve a particular goal, sort of minimize some objective, for example, uh, you have some model of the system you want to control, up, you know, control people call this a plant. And, um, and then you, you propose a sequence of commands, you see what the value of the objective is, and you run kind of a simulator of this plant, and then you can use various uh, gradient descent or other algorithms to figure out the sequence of commands that will opti optimize this objective over a sequence um, um, of, of, of kind of fu you know future sequence. That's how you plan. That's how optimal control works, uh, classical optimal control. And the question is, could we learn this model? This is the model of the world that we need to learn. Um, this idea that we should use models of the world goes back a long time in machine learning. This is an uh, extract from a, a paper by Rich Sutton um, proposing the Dyna architecture, and he said the main idea of Dyna is the old common sense idea that planning is trying things in your head using an internal model of the world. This suggests the existence of a more primitive process for trying things not in your head, but through direct interaction with the world. Reinforcement learning is the name that we use for this more primitive direct kind of trying, and Dyna is the extension of reinforcement learning to include a learned world model. So wh what he was calling Dyna was a particular uh, instance of what we is now called um, uh, model-based reinforcement learning, really. Um, but, but that asks the question, you know, if we had to build an autonomous uh, intelligent system, what architecture should, should it have? And, you know, obviously the intelligent system should have, you know, something that is able to perceive the state of the world and then produce actions that, you know, act directly on the world and <coughs> is driven by, you know, it's kind of basal ganglia kind of thing. Uh, some sort of objective that measures how unhappy it is, or happy. Um, and so what the agent is trying to do is bring the world into a state that will bring itself into a state that when a state is fed to its basal ganglia or equivalent, um, the happiness will be high or unhappiness will be low. 
but internal to the agent, if you want the agent to act intelligently, it should have this world model, this world simulator, because it, it will have to be able to kind of propose, you know, kind of think about action proposals and kind of use its internal model to figure out what the consequences of these actions is, are, are going to be, and then, you know, uh, plan ahead, um, you know, possible actions. And of course, it should also be able to predict what the long-term expected value of this objective is going to be uh, in, in reinforcement learning, that's called a critic. <coughs> um, so those two are, this is a model of the external world, and this is a model of your basal ganglia, if you want, it's kind of a predictor of, of rewards, if you want. Um, and we know how to build those two things, we have no idea how to build this. That's the main, the main technical problem we're facing, in my opinion, okay? Not everybody agrees with me on this, I should say. Um, and, and so when we're in a particular situation, you know, we, uh, we use our internal model of the world to kind of, you know, figure out what a sequence of particular action will produce, and we kind of infer a sequence of action that will optimize the, the you know, minimize the unhappiness as predicted by a critic, if you want. Um, and then, you know, take the first action and then repeat the process. So how do we learn predictive models of the world? Um, and the problem, the main technical issue there is that the world is not really predictable. It's, there is a lot of uncertainty in the world. So for example, if your world consists of, you know, you have two eyes and your two eyes have exactly one pixel each, right? And those are the values of the two pixels and your entire universe consists of observations that are those, right? So these are everything you've observed in the world. There's obviously a dependency between what your left eye and your right eye uh, pixel uh, sees. Um, and that dependency is roughly that, you know, y2 is kind of a quadratic function of y1. So if I give you a value of y1, let, let's say this one, you can predict what y2 is going to be roughly. If I give you this value of y2, you can tell me, well, y1 can be either this or that. Um, but there is a dependency here, which is not a deterministic dependency. It's not like I can directly compute y1 from y2 or the other way around. Um, I can just kind of model the dependency. And how, you know, how, how do you do this with uh, machine learning? Um, what you can have is some sort of contrast function. So basically a function that tells you how compatible y1 and y2 are. Um, so this contrast function would, would look something like this. So it would start maybe flat and then it would kind of learn to uh, distinguish between things that actually are observed and things that are not observed, which are those maybe, you know, other points outside of those, those blue points. So those blue points is all the observations in the world. The green points and everything else is anything you don't observe. And what you'd like is a machine to be able to learn this contrast function that tells you low value if it's something that looks kosher, high value if it's something that looks really weird and either breaks my model of the world or I should pay attention to or maybe it's dangerous or maybe I should learn from it. Um, and until fairly recently, the, the methods for this uh, were based on things like, like reconstruction. So um, there's a lot of algorithms people have proposed over the last, uh, you know, starting with all thousand field, but, you know, there is a bunch of others, uh, more recent ones, where you can, you know, learn very simple um, uh, features like uh, oriented edges, you know, kind of V1-like features by basically telling a, a system, here's a patch of an image, reconstruct this patch under some constraints of the rep internal representation, like sparsity or whatever. Um, and naturally, because of the statistics of natural images, edge, you know, oriented edge detectors emerge. Uh, you know, very similar to what you observe in V1 if you, if you um, uh, constrain the architecture of the system to be similar. Um, so, you know, simple concepts like this can be learned uh, um, uh, very easily. Um, but until recently, we, we, we didn't have kind of a, a good way of learning to predict under uncertainty unless the type of things we're trying to predict was discrete. So for example, if I give you uh, a text corpus and I ask you build a learning machine that predicts the next word from a bunch of words that appear before that, that works pretty well. That's called language modeling. It's used everywhere in uh, text processing. And you can, you, know, you can train systems to predict the next word with some level of accuracy. And it's, of course, it's impossible to predict exactly what the next word is gonna be, but it's relatively easy to represent a distribution over all the possible words that could possibly appear. It's just a big list of numbers between zero and one that's on to one, okay? Maybe 100,000 of them or so. Uh, we can do that. Now, if I do this with video, so I show you a segment of a video and I ask you, or I ask the system, uh, you know, draw me the, the, the next few frames in that video. There's, there's no way you can exactly predict what's gonna happen. And it's because, you know, the world is not entirely predictable. So um, here are, you know, imagine all your 
your, your, your entire universe is composed of videos of someone putting a pen on the table and then letting it, letting it go. Um, you cannot actually predict exactly where the pen is gonna fall. You know, it may fall this way, it may fall that way. I, there's just not enough accuracy in the perception. There is all kinds of ways the person can move the finger beforehand. So you can't really predict just before the person lifts the finger where the, uh, the pen is gonna fall. So if you use standard supervised learning techniques where you tell the machine, look at the past, try to predict the future, and the machine predicts this, and you tell the machine, oh, you're wrong, it's actually that, you get an error in the prediction. And if you train the machine to, to uh, actually you know, predict the actual thing that happens, there is no way it can predict it. And so the only way it can, it can predict here, the, the result that's gonna happen is that it's gonna predict the average of all the possible futures that may possibly happen, which is sort of a, a transparent version of this pen in all possible orientations, which is not a good prediction. So the progress that has occurred in the last uh, few years uh, came out of Yosha Bencho's lab, uh, 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 Ian Goodfellow and, and his co-authors, um, is the idea of generative adversarial networks and it's uh, a technique to handle this prediction under uncertainty. So uh, basically you have a predictor, it looks at the past, in this particular instance, looks at the past, it gets a source of random vectors and it makes a, a prediction and that prediction depends on the particular instance of the random vector that is being drawn here. Uh, and that's decided a priori how, you know, what the dimension and how you draw this vector. Um, so let's imagine that you draw a vector, the machine makes this prediction, and the world tells it actually what happened is that uh, in the space of possible outputs. Um, there is some sort of you know, manifold of possible predictions here, and uh, the way you're gonna train the machine is gonna, you're gonna tell it, okay, you made the wrong prediction, but as long as your prediction is on this manifold of possible futures, I'm not gonna punish you for it. Uh, the problem, of course, is that we have no idea what this manifold looks like, so we need to train another neural net to actually learn this, and that neural net is very similar, is a very similar type of the one that I, I showed earlier. This is the manifold of possible futures, and you, know, you need this neural net to tell you, yeah, this is kosher as a possible future, or this is not kosher. So that's the idea of adversarial nets. You have two networks, a generator that predicts, a discriminator that tells you whether the prediction looks good or not. And the discriminator learns to basically, is trained with data from the real world, what actually occurs, and it's trying to produce a low output. And then you show it predictions from the generator, which originally are bad, and you tell it, you know, tell me that this is bad. Um, so the green points here come from the generator, they're bad. And you tell the, the contrast function here, go up. And for actual point from the world, you tell it, go down. And so the discriminator learns to tell the difference between actual futures and bad futures. And eventually the generator using information of the gradient from the discriminator trains itself to produce uh, predictions that are actually, that the discriminator can't tell are, are fake. And that works amazingly well. I'm not gonna show samples, but, um, but it works really well. And I'm just gonna show you some examples in video predictions. Video predictions. So this is if you train this predictor with uh, square essentially so it produces blurry predictions because it can't really tell what of all the possible things uh, that the future might bring which of those will happen so it's a blurry average and this is kind of what happens when you train with a discriminative technique um, and the, f the first four frames of each of the little snippets here are observed and the last two indicated by the red uh, uh, contour here are predicted um, so it's much crisper these are other examples from uh, New York apartments um, in fact, next one. So here the, the camera rotates and the machine sort of makes up what this bookcase looks like as the camera keeps rotating. It's never seen this apartment before. Or it makes up what, uh, what this couch looks like as the camera rotates. So it has some idea what the structure of the world is. Now whether we can use this kind of technique for machines to really build you know, hierarchical high level representations of the world that can predict is not clear. Here's another example where here the machine is not trained with uh, pixels directly, but it's trained with um, what's called semantic segmentation maps. So basically things like the result of the vision system I showed you earlier. And uh, again, there's a few frames that are observed and then three frames that are predicted corresponding to uh, something like half a second in the future. And a pedestrian that starts crossing the street keeps crossing the street. The car that turns left keeps turning left. Uh, you know, the, y you can, I it's a good idea if you are building a self-driving car to have some idea of what other objects in the, in the world around you are gonna do. Um, 
But here's another idea that we've been working on over the last uh, uh, few months uh, with uh, uh, two of my students here at, at NYU, Michael Enaf and uh, Jake Zhao. Um, and it's a, a different approach to predicting under uncertainty where you observe the past and uh, you, you run this through a neural net with you know, several layers. It produces an internal representation. Ignore the top for now. Um, and that goes to a decoder that tries to predict the, the future, let's say. And then you compare that prediction with what actually occurs and compute the difference between them. So that gives you a vector, which is the, the difference between the two. And then you train a third neural net to basically say, how should I, to predict how the input the hidden representation should be modified in such a way that the prediction of the system actually matches what happens in the real world. Um, and so all of those is trained in a process that I'm not gonna describe, but uh, what happens in the end is that you can, um, you can uh, uh, let me just show you one example. So this is a, an example of a, a, a little game where it's like a, a spaceship that has controllable thrust and uh, its goal is to go to one of those planets and there is like a, another planet with gravity and it doesn't have enough thrust to actually you know, completely counteract the, the gravity here. And it learns a model of its world. So it, it learns a forward predictive model of you know, where am I gonna be uh, in a few seconds if I uh, act uh, in a particular way. Um, and then it has this goal, which is, uh, you know, minimize the distance to one of the, go one of the planets, the target planets, and eventually learns to, to do this planning model based with way fewer interactions with the world and way fewer death, if you want, uh, as if you use sort of classical reinforcement learning. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We have time for some questions. I have one in the middle and one on the aisle. Uh, we're going to reset the discrimination function as to whether you're old and have asked questions before. But um, so, first in the middle. Thank you for the great talk. So I'm I'm wondering like how long the horizon can be for the prediction to go, and uh, for very long uh, like horizon, like can uh, like if we know how to do the hierarchy, then is this is this can simply be solved by a kind of high level like uh, process of this. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, um, so we're, we're not there yet. So, um, and so the question is, we can do short-term prediction at a low level. So we can probably predict at a pixel level within a few frames, but then you know very quickly it goes haywire. So then there is the next level up where you have basically an object repre object-based representation, for example, in the visual context. But you know it may be a different type of uh, prediction you're trying to do, which may be about dialogue or social interaction or whatever. Um, but there has to be some sort of higher-level representation where you can do longer term prediction, but less precise. And, and hopefully, I mean, what, one thing we are after, of course, is to find some, some process by which we can sort of stack multiple layers like this and get the system to learn higher and higher level representations and be able to make longer and long longer term predictions. Uh, but we haven't really done this yet. Dan. Beautiful and elegant ways to show how we can build these higher level models and then predict the sorts of behaviors that we all do. Nervous systems of simpler creatures show us examples of similar behaviors that apparently are not learned but built in. And this is an argument for saying the structure of simple nervous systems can tell us something about the structure of what it is that is learned. Because a cockroach is very good at future prediction, as anybody who's tried to swat one knows. Very small creatures when born, ducklings for instance, have those motor behaviors that you show take nine months for us to develop with complex visual input sure. and building patterns of the real world. Right. So the question is, what does the structure of nervous systems that can do this without input learned from the world, from the plant, tell us about the most efficient ways to do this? Right, so there was a debate a few months ago between me and Gary Marcus precisely on that question, how much innate, uh, uh, in this very room, if I remember correctly, no, I was, uh, it was at NYU, okay? But um, uh, the question is how much innate hardwired prior information is necessary for AI to emerge. And I think the, the trade-off is different for different animals and, and humans. So every, um, every sort of hardwired innate uh, uh, structure you build in will speed up 
the type of running you do for, for, for this uh, type of behavior, of course. So that will allow, you know, gazelles to walk within minutes uh, or, or, you know, baby ibexes to, or mountain goats to, you know, basically walk on the side of a mountain very quickly and, uh, you know, escape foxes and stuff. But um, for that, you need a lot of innate structure. But any innate structure you build in limits the uh, adaptability of the animal. And, you know, what's really interesting about primates is their adaptability. So uh, that seems to suggest that there is, you know, probably considerably less in its structure in uh, humans and, and, and primates than, than there is in, you know, certainly cockroaches, I would hope. Joshua, then Ronnie, then Dick. So I clearly agree with the, the cake analogy. Uh, but there is an, an element, and, and I'm a big proponent, I've been for a long time a big supporter of unsupervised learning, but there's an element which uh, really uh, tips the scale in favor of supervised learning, uh, at least some kinds of supervised learning where the labels correspond to things like names of things in the world that humans have come up with. So these are high level abstractions which contain a lot more interesting and useful information. So it's not, not every bit of information is not worth as much to understand the world in other ways. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, in fact, you know, most of the successful applications of machine learning today are all basically supervised learning, essentially. So um, from the practical point of view, uh, you're, if you are, you know, a company like Facebook or Google, your money is well spent just hiring people to label data um, than it is to come up with the, the next uh, best unsupervised learning algorithm. But we, we do have experiments at Facebook. You know, this is work by uh, people at Facebook that I'm not going to talk about today, but where for example, you train a vision system not by showing it hand-labeled images, but by, sh by uh, training it to predict uh, hashtags, which are somewhat random. I mean, they're produced by humans, but are kind of somewhat, uh, somewhat random. Or you train, you train them as basically an autoencoder. Um, and what you notice is that the features that are learned by those systems are basically as good as what you would get by training on, say, ImageNet. Uh, so that, that's kind of interesting, because so now we are, tr we are starting to have semi-supervised or completely unsupervised systems that when we train them produce uh, features that are almost as good as the one we get by, you know, throwing a lot of uh, label data at them. And, uh, you know, you and I have been working very actively in the early 2000s on unsupervised learning for deep learning. We thought that was the ticket until we realized we could actually use supervised learning and it worked fine. Uh, but we're kind of both coming back to this, right? So, right, I mean, so did I, but, um, but we know that in practice, the stuff that actually works is, uh, is supervised running. I think we're going to see this wave, you know, as I, as I showed in this slide, uh, you're going to see this, this wave over the next couple of years of people starting to use unsupervised running for practical purpose. Ronnie. Yeah, um, so the notion of prediction, it seems that this is essential, and, and I agree, but, but what, what you mean by prediction is taking the actual future, and that's how you train the network. And so I'm just wondering, people are actually not that good predictors and definitely under uncertainty and in many ways and that has been shown all around and so I'm just wondering what happens if you try and train the network with actual errors that people make in their prediction it will be harder because you'll have less data than just taking images and, and, and facts from the world but would the network learn something maybe even more interesting if you, if you train by the errors that people make as well. Well, I wish we were at the point where we could make this kind of comparisons, but we can't at the moment. The algorithms we have are still too primitive. We're just trying to get them to work for very simple things. So, uh, you know, the, the I, we're, not, we're not at the point where we can compare um, uh, predictions of those systems with, with human prediction. We haven't figured out the principle, like, you know, um, there was an idea, you know, in the, you know, backprop applied to convolutional net, the idea that uh, a system can learn hierarchical representations of the world, you know, in the supervised mode. Uh, and, and the fact that you can use the same, the same learning algorithm at the low level and the high level, basically, you know, uh, uh, unchanged, and it will naturally produce, you know, oriented edge, edge detectors at a low level, and motif detectors at the middle level and objects at the top level. We need the equivalent uh, kind of recursive multi-layer idea, if you want, for learning representations from for, through prediction. And we haven't figured this out yet. So, you know, right now we can, you know, predict a few frames in the future from a video. We can predict, you know, maybe a bit more 
in the future using those uh, semantic segmentation maps, which is cheating a little bit, right? We, we are kind of using a pre-trained supervised system uh, uh, to pre-process the data. Um, we have some ideas, perhaps, of, uh, on, on how to make this recursive, but uh, it, it you know, doesn't work yet. So, Dick, last question. Thank you, Jan. Uh, when you were talking about common sense uh, being related to filling in the blanks, uh, I was thinking of uh, recursive networks and pattern completion. Uh, now, in much of the AI stuff that I know about from a naive point of view, it's visual system inspired. It stacks a feed-forward network, and there is feedback, but the feedback is not the same kind that you see in a region like CA3 of the hippocampus. To what extent do you think progress could be made by taking another leaf out of biology and uh, interposing feed-forward and recurrent and feed-forward and recurrent as is seen biologically? Right, so I, mean, all, I think many of us, you know, Yoshua included, are, um, convinced that eventually the best vision system will, will have uh, local feedback, first of all. So things, you know, you can imagine doing things like edge uh, completion uh, without, without some sort of feedback. Now, the thing that, that you observe right now is that the kind of architectures people use for practical vision systems have a huge number of layers, something like 100 layers. Uh, they're used every day, right? So, you know, people on Facebook, uh, there's 2 billion users, 2.2 billion users, they upload 2 billion photos on Facebook every day. Each, thing, each of those photos uh, goes through four convolutional nets, and they're all convolutional nets with those 100 layers or so. And y you could think of the, the, the top layers basically as, in effect, being recurrent. They're not really recurrent, but you can think of it, th th those 100 layers, as being kind of unfolded versions of kind of a, a single layer uh, in, in, in some ways. And so it looks like just naturally by, optimize, by trying to optimize the performance of the systems, their accuracy, we're going more towards uh, systems that are not just you know, feed forward with 10 layers or 20 layers, they're more like, you know, let me think about it for a while, you know, um, and kind of circle around 100 times before I give you an answer. It so help with common uh, sense, though. No, that is very, very far from common sense. So, uh, you know, I think um, the, the, the world model I, I, I kind of hypothesized here is, is a recurrent, uh, a model. You give it the state, you know, some estimate of the state of the world at time t and an action and it predicts the, uh, you know, tries to predict the state of the world at time t plus one or t plus something, right? And then you reapply it. So it's an unfolded recurrent network if you want. Um, so in that sense, it, uh, that's, that's how it does uh, completion. Okay, let's thank Jan. Thank you.